Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. And what a weird day to be teaching Shadow of the Crystal Palace, the Critical Role Cthulhu one-shot. It's from 2019, but as it turned out, it was possibly the perfect week to assign it. Because at the end of class, uh, we meet from 11 to 12.15 Central Time, the Critical Role production team revealed an eight minute video about its new set, which we screened at the end of class, and which mentions explicitly the ways in which Shadow of the Crystal Palace was the first experiment in a more intense set design. And of course, that was something that we had been discussing in class today, so I shrieked like the nerd I am. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This wasn't just a day to talk about a cool ass set and cool props and costumes, although those were all things that folks mentioned on Perusal while viewing the first half of Shadow of the Crystal Palace. I've been splitting up actual plays into two parts, and this works particularly well for this Cthulhu one-shot because it ends on a amazing cliffhanger. And that's a really good place to have a discussion in any class, is what do you think will happen in the second half? We talked about Cthulhu's mechanics by way of looking at the uh, a standard character sheet for an investigator, a player character in the Cthulhu mythos. On Thursday, we will talk about some scholarship relating to the Cthulhu mythos fandom, and we'll be talking to London Carlyle. But for today, we just took a look at the character sheet to see how is this different from, say, 5th edition D&D, or Brindlewood Bay, or Good Society, or some of the other character creating games that we have played or have taken a look at. And of course, the first thing that you notice is that an enormous amount of the sheet is covered with skills, very little relating to combat. This is a mystery and investigation game, but also one that is remarkably deadly compared to something like 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. We talked about uh, and tapped into their theoretical knowledge of the notion of the uncanny or the unheimlich. Um, a central principle of the way horror works and its logic, which is so much tied into um, the kind of fine sense of offness. When Freud talks about the uncanny and literature professors talk about Freud because we can't seem to let him go, um, but in his writing on the uncanny, uh, which is often uh, referred to, he's talking about uh, Coppelia, the, the story of um, the pep had come to life. And from there, it was an easy stretch to say, hey, remember the idea of the uncanny valley? The notion in artificial intelligence and robotics about the attempt to make something as lifelike as possible, but the closer you get to humanity and fail, the creepier it is which is why Wally looks adorable as opposed to trying to look like a human. We've not yet superseded the, uh, the, the nadir that is the Uncanny Valley. And of course, as I was paying attention to just the first half of Shadow of the Crystal Palace, what's notable is the fact that it is all in the players' minds. Aside from the very first references to um, NPCs that are not facing the characters and saying weird stuff that triggers sanity rolls, there's not anything that has happened yet. It's all about the suspense inherent in the expectation of the genre. The players and the audience know this is a Call of Cthulhu game, know it's a game of cosmic horror, and thus have expectations that lead us to jump at literally everything. Even cats can become uncanny, or as one of my students noted, cats have such an outsized relationship to the Cthulhu mythos that it's actually not surprising to see them first played for laughs. This is set in a camp fanciers um, exhibition, but then potentially have the ability to transform into something else. Stay tuned. 
I asked students about context. Uh, once we talked about Cthulhu and, and to a little extent uh, Lovecraft, who was of course writing in the early 20th century, I noted that we are talking about a structure, the Crystal Palace, that was created in 1851, but Talos and Jaffe doesn't choose 1851 as his setting for Shadow of the Crystal Palace. Instead, we are set decades later in some unspecified entirely specified moment where the Crystal Palace is not yet a, a total ruin as it will be in the early 1930s, but has definitely fallen into some form of, if not neglect, obs obscurity. It is no longer the dazzling must-see exhibition um, that l would launch a billion million world's fairs. It's also an interesting portrait of a colonial power, not yet in decline, but certainly not uh, flexing in the way that it does in 1851. As I mentioned on Twitter today, we can think in some ways as about the Great Exhibition and the Crystal Palace as itself the kind of inherently horrific. It is, after all, a beautiful gilded cage into which the treasures of many nations and many peoples were paraded as the spoils of the colonial project. So, kind of creepy. Well, super creepy. As one of my students noted, the juxtaposition of glass and iron that is the Crystal Palace, and we took a look at some of the recreations of the Crystal Palace, means that there is a constant refraction of light. Shadow and light are very important concepts that um, both Talos and Jaffe is playing with as DM, and the players are picking up because they know this is called Shadow of the Crystal Palace. There are lanterns that are in play, and as we will see, lighting effects become an important part of immersion in this performance. It was interesting because I was re-watching this as a listener. I, I've seen this several times before. Um, but this time I was prepping for class by listening to it as an audio experience. I will say it holds up, but what is notable is indeed how much is in those images, or for me, the memory of those images, of the costuming choices, of the set, of the way the set transforms, of the props, and the ways that they are used as puzzles and clues, and of course, the use of maps. And I have a video on, here on my channel about how the first time that I saw Shadow of the Crystal Palace, it really resonated with me because I was in the middle of running an 18th century Dungeons and Dragons campaign set at the Gothic erection Strawberry Hill House. Um, and you can see more of how I did that and how you could use uh, sources like that. And I make reference to the way that Talos and Jaffe uses real historical context for Shadow of the Crystal Palace. In fact, more than even I remembered. So once students had kind of vibed with all of the different reactions they were having, the questions that they had, I turned to a question that I had set our education majors up for, but wanted to throw out to the rest of the class. Should I teach this actual play one shot next semester in a core literature course designed for freshmen and sophomores who are non-majors and not in my college? The first responses were all about the challenges inherent in doing so. It is, after all, four hours long in a genre that students are unfamiliar with. Those are really serious uh, concerns. And as another student noted, it's important that the time investment be equivalent to the or uh, uh, equivalent to the perceived richness um, or reward or value to the class. And so I said, those are important challenges. How do we meet those challenges? One possibility is to break this up still further instead of two class sessions, uh, break it up even further so that it's one hour at a time. Not entirely sure that works pacing wise, but you could do it um, and you could use it as a through line to talk about um, different elements of the Crystal Palace, a way of thinking about the colonial project in a different way, a way of thinking about the Victorian period as one that is 
has a long duration over time. Uh, that 1851 is very different from the 1880s or the 1890s. All of those are important uh, potential variables, and you can weave in shorter literary texts alongside these. My education majors were more optimistic. They noted that, of course, they're all non-majors, and they were not especially invested in actual play, and indeed had no experience with actual play until the start of this semester, and they were still engaged and they still found something useful. Some students noted that, of course, different modalities, different ways of consuming media are useful for students. So, for example, while one student might find a video a slog, another student, say a student with different kinds of forms of dyslexia, for example, may find videos better. One of the things that we definitely agreed on and something that I've talked about in previous videos is the need for scaffolding, the need for a lecture about what actual play is, how it functions, and how we consume it. And I actually think that's a really useful thing to bring into the space of my core literature class, and I'll probably talk about this more in another video at the end of the semester, um, because the defamiliarization of how do we approach a new genre is, I think, something that's valuable to a core literature course. The other thing that I think is really valuable is the notion that our attention looks different with different ways of consuming media. So, for example, I teach the 18th century novel. The 18th century novel was read by human beings, and sometimes it was read alone, but far more people read it in community while sewing or playing cards or, you know, tending to children while one person read out loud. The original audiobooks, folks. In, a, in the same way, our previous discussion with B. Dave Walters, which is available on this channel, B. Dave talks about mom listening and how many folks are aware that this is a new genre where a large number of those who consume that media are doing so while doing something else, even if they're watching a video stream. And I think that's an important thing to think about is the idea that, you know, you can indeed watch something for the first time or consume it in some way that makes it an easier kind of access point and then come back, right? And this is also going to be a class that is intensely about looking more closely at, at pieces, about analyzing with care and attention. And so the idea of kind of recursive or repeated viewing, not necessarily of the whole, but of, of small parts to see how they work, is important. And it's actually something that the genre has uh, kind of really built into the larger culture, um, the notion of the supercut, the notion of the, the gif. Um, Ars Queef has given us much in critical role fandom. So these were all, so we didn't settle the answer of whether I will teach this in core literature next semester, but I'm highly inclined to make the attempt. This is something that I'm thinking about because of course we are also in book ordering time. It will soon be class registration. I can't believe it. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see um, how that all fits in with the course pack I build from Broadview. So that was the conversation for today. Uh, and so we are in the first half of uh, Shadow of the Crystal Palace, where it's all set up, no payoff just yet. Um, and so on Thursday, we will be joined, excitingly enough, by our very first in-person guest, my former student, London Carlisle, who graduated from Auburn and is now a stage actor based primarily in New York. During the pandemic, when stages were dark, uh, he also made, uh, you know, spent a lot of time as a DM spe spe specializing in horror. And in fact, that's how I know London is because we worked together on a production of Frankenstein in 2016 here at Auburn. And so, and he's adapted Frankenstein for uh, his DMing for things like Streams of Blood. So I'm excited, as I've mentioned before in other videos, uh, to have London come and talk. He's uh, 
in a show at the Alliance with great reviews, which is really wonderful. He's able to come over, it's about 90 minutes away, uh, to come and talk to us about what it's like to be that kind of next generation streamer, uh, someone who has watched folks um, in addition to performing himself, um, as well as what it's like to work with the stuff of horror as an enthusiast, and also in the shadow of the kind of eugenicist, racist context uh, that originates with H.P. Lovecraft, how do we make Cthulhu and other horror properties our own? And so his and his important, valuable voice, and I'm so, so excited and very, very proud and honored to have him with us. I know the students are excited because it's a person coming to class. Um, I'm going to try to record that class session on Zoom in such a way that we can share that conversation with you. Stay tuned. But man, is it an exciting week in other ways as well. Um, we are all, of course, on Tenderhoot Cooks. Um, about a quarter of my class came in as uh, critters. I think there are more now. It'll be very interesting to see the reactions next week. Uh, after we have all seen the first episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. But of course, it's also a big week in uh, endings uh, this week as well. Um, the seven uh, Dimension 20s all-female fantasy high uh, narrative is ending tomorrow on Wednesday, um, which is another thing that students have been watching. And the very long running uh, LA by Night is still continuing on to its conclusion and has a big penultimate episode on Friday. Uh, so that's just the kind of biggies in our world. And of course, um, we are eagerly awaiting further uh, developments in, say, dun the conclusion of Dungeons and Daddies, which I know one of my students is, is a big fan of. So yeah, so we've got uh, a lot on our plates these days as we start to transition um, to student projects, uh, which will be coming around the pike in um, around week 13. So we've got two more weeks of us doing stuff that are that's structured in class before we have two weeks of lab time, students doing whatever they want um, to get their on essays done, and then a final week of sharing. Uh, so I am a busy beaver. Um, we will be doing um, Disco Elysium next week. And uh, so that should be a low prep week for us all. Um, it, it requires some viewing or some playing, but no reading. And, uh, and I'm ready to talk about it on the kind of drop of a hat um, so that I can put my energy into the week after that, which is running. Alice is missing for five tables simultaneously in my classroom, but that's for a different video. For now, thanks for watching. It's always fun uh, to talk about how well the class is going um, in unexpected directions. See you on Thursday.